I've talked about this with Elihu Foistel on this show before, but I want to give you a chance because every time Borchard is on, you always, you're very complimentary of him. You're like, he's a super smart guy. Um, but then he gives a parlay at the end and it drives you crazy. But there are certain, certain times where parlays you believe are correct to do or justified. One yes. Of those. And that Elihu, one of the top 10 greatest sports betting minds. I'm going to go top one or two. There's always some people we don't know about. That's true. So I like to be conservative. Okay, but I, I, I yeah. have no problem with you yeah. putting him top three. So when do we parlay? Like I'm a big anti-parlay guy, but it's really not true. I parlay all the time. So there's three key reasons to parlay. Number one, correlations. Nothing is better than getting a nice correlation between two events and being paid like they're not correlated. So you have to be careful when you play things like same game parlays that are correlated because if you stack players uh, like a quarterback over to a wide receiver over, you're not going to get the true payout. But if you can find something that is a little bit of a hidden correlation, example, MLB, big road favorite, parlay them to the over. It has everything you want in the correlation. You like that favorite of the over? You like the fact that if the visitor wins, you're going to get the full nine innings. You're going to get the bottom of the ninth in every time. Exactly. That's right. So let me just let me go back just to clarify for those who are newer to better who, who might have missed it. What Steve was referring to is same game parlays that are packaged by sports books. You are not getting the true bang for your buck. You're not getting true odds. Those are packaged in a way. What he is talking about is stuff that exists out there that is in truth correlated and you will get the true odds for. It's just that. They sort of fly under the radar, if you will. Exactly. Another example is a nor'easter is blowing up the coast, and maybe it's going to hit, maybe it's not, and you've got a lot of locations in football games that are really close together, and you say, you know, I'm going to stack like three college football games that are all going on at similar venues close together. I'll play all three under and hope that that storm front moves three through, affecting each and every game, and they're obviously correlated a couple other reasons to play parlays yeah so to circumvent limits so sometimes places deal very low limits you see them oh my god a bet is too good to be true i will give the poster child of this so i'm aware of this gentleman he did not work directly with me full disclosure he walks into the hard rock which used to be an independent book and lsu college football was catching 35 points against louisiana monroe not laying catching, catching. wow catching plus 35 he proceeded to bet parlay LSU plus 35, a good bet, I might add, to the entire board, $90 a pop, 100 times. Made bet $9,000 on LSU plus 35, came back two days later, was immediately barred from playing. They screamed at me. He said, why are you so mad at me? They won by 40. The spread didn't matter. Plus, minus, whatever. Yeah, but he circumvented the limit that had been established had he bet it just straight that way. Exactly right. Okay. So, and now, now this, I'm sort of, I'm laughing inside already because I know... I think I know where the third reason is because it's a Steve Fezzik special. Would you like to? Sure. sure, sure. So yeah. um, you you parlay stuff when you can get a number that a point spread that is not available, is not widely available. And usually that occurs with half point parlay cards or ties win parlay cards where uh, spread moves. Northwestern's playing Illinois. The line's 21. Illinois' quarterback goes out and the line goes down to 18. You can still play Northwestern plus 21 and a half on the parlay card. Gimme, gimme, gimme. All you can get, yes. provided, you know, yeah. you can get away with it. I was going to say, this is where I have to make the disclaimer. I hope you'll appreciate it. This has gotten Steve, uh, well, banned before from certain sports books, maybe even the one that we're sitting in. And, you know, I'm going to give credit to Joe Lupo, former um, director of the Stardust. 1996, Joe was the first person to request that I not play those anymore. Okay. And, in fact, he said to me, Steve, um, you can't play here. The rest of the year. Yeah, the rest of the year. Arbitrarily. That's the first time I ever got <laughs> back to the, the rest of the year. Now, this was in September. I interpreted that to be December 31st. You know, that was my own interpretation. You went calendar year. So January 1st, yeah, yeah, I was back at El Dorado <laughs> and all the coast properties. Let me, let me just ask you a personal question. It's just me and you, Steve. No one's listening here. It's just me and no. you. You are you are the nicest guy in the world. On Twitter, you would even admit you're a little uh, you're a little different. You right? You, Helmuthish. You're, you're like yeah. Charles Oakley out there, right? You, Jeff Benson. You you know, you guys, you guys <laughs> are Jeff nicest Benson people, so nicest people in real in real life. Get a little ornery on Twitter. So when when people say that to you, when a sports book says that to you, and they're like, "Steve, listen, calendar year or forever, uh, you can't bet this anymore." What what inside you boils where you're like, "I must exploit every living edge that's out there, no matter what this human being tells me." To be fair, with the Joe Lupo situation, I think Joe had 
properly expressed that I was to me that I was pushing the envelope. Yes. And so I'm gonna I'm gonna I'll take the blame for that one. Okay. So that was okay. Yeah. And I, I and I was and I think I was playing excessively. You know, remember back so then. What I read into that is that you if you feel disrespected, you will continue. If you feel respected, you will not. Is that correct? Is um, no, if, just if I feel I was properly told, communicated, or, or made to. or communicated that I that we were at a point where I was. Could I you was, possibly be misinterpreting at times that you you are the one where the communication breakdown exists? Oh, of course. <laughs> okay, absolutely. Just I was not a communications major <laughs> okay. in school. I'm a, I'm like a left brain math geek that can barely <laughs> formulate a sentence. That's why. I became an actuary. Uh, and and a, a great one I would imagine you were, because you are, by the way, I don't even say Foistel is one of the great minds, but you are as well. People should know that about you, that you are truly one of the great mathematical uh, sports betting minds, and you know how to exploit stuff in a way that mere mortals do not. Let me talk about one other thing that's going on here. So that's that's the parlay dissertation. But we're right here. July is about to happen tomorrow. Uh, people are betting MLB sides. They're betting MLB totals. Why do you view that as a uh, as a fool's errand? I'm not going to say it's a hundred percent fool's errand. That's a little strong, but it is not efficient to try to make a lot of money in July because the very efficiency of the market, I would argue, is really as tough as it's going to be. So think about it. There's no NBA going on. I know the content providers are having a good old time telling you who's going to win the NBA. But there's nothing to bet on other than the futures markets and the um, NFL, real quiet. All the players are off for a couple of weeks. No one is betting any of the major sports. I, we're betting women's tennis. I get that. Mm -hmm. But the limits are low. So the odds maker is the attention. The only thing with big limits is baseball. So because of that, it's very rare come the day of the game that you're going to be able to find a really good bet. And there's a reason that when you have John Legacy, boy, I wish he brought a little more energy to the show. <laughs> um, but when he comes on and all of a sudden he's betting division bets and he's betting first fives and stuff, you know, kudos to him. So he's like the stuff he's finding has got to be a little bit more niche, a little bit more derivatives than the bread and butter sides and totals on the day of the game. I will tell you, this is even this is not what you're necessarily talking about. But even when I was handicapping baseball every day for seasons, I remember right after the All-Star break specifically, the numbers would kind of go on the fritz anyway. They wouldn't work. And I, mm. we never could figure out if it was the way that they just came back out of the break. They just didn't – I don't know if guys weren't ready to play in the same way, but there was always that too, which has nothing to do with what you're talking about, but it's also just a layer to add. And not to mention, I mean, and, and you knew about this when you were you're betting professionally on baseball – that um, the markets were low. You couldn't give it out to your clients. Texas was minus 120. You make Texas minus 160. That's right. And then you you have to choose, do I give it out to my clients minus 144? And that's really a difficult decision. Your numbers still support it. But you know what? Now you're gambling. Now you're, instead of just winning, betting Texas minus 120, now we're arguably advantage gaming minus 144, but the edge is small if it's there at all. Go to vsun.com slash subscribe to become a vsun pro subscriber today.